Section 23, Book the 23rd of the Iliad of Homer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stephen Carney. The Iliad of Homer by Homer, translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. Section 23, Book the 23rd. Argument. Achilles, admonished in a dream by the ghost of his friend, celebrates the funeral of Patroclus. Thus they indeed were mourning through the city, but the Greeks, as soon as they reached the ships and the Hellespont, were separated each to his own ship. But Achilles did not permit the Myrmidons to be dispersed, but he spoke amongst his warlike companions thus. Ye swift-horsed Myrmidons, comrades dear to me, let us not yet loose the solid hooved steeds from under our chariots, but with the very horses and chariots going near, let us bewail Patroclus, for this is the honour of the dead. But when we have indulged sad lamentation, unyoking our steeds, we will all sup here. Thus he spoke, but they mourned in a body, and Achilles led the way. Thrice they drove their fair-maned steeds around the body, grieving, and among them Thetis kindled a longing for lamentation. Moistened were the sands, and moistened were the arms of the men with tears, for so brave a master of the flight they longed. But among them the son of Peleus led the abundant lamentation, laying his manslaughtering hands upon the breast of his companion. Hail, O Patroclus, even in the dwelling of Hades, for now shall I accomplish all those things which formerly I promised, that having dragged Hector hither, I would give him to the dogs to be devoured raw, and that they before thy pile I would cut the necks of twelve illustrious sons of the Trojans, enraged on account of thee slain. He spoke, and meditated unworthy deeds against noble Hector, having stretched him prone in the dust before the bier of Menoetiades. But they each stripped off his brazen, glittering armor, and unyoked their high-sounding steeds. They sat also in crowds at the ship of swift-footed Achades, but he afforded to them an agreeable funeral feast. Many white bulls were stretched around by the axe, having their throats cut, and many sheep and bleating goats many white-tusked swine also abounding in fat were extended for roasting in the flame of vulcan and on every side around the dead body flowed abundant blood but the chiefs of the greeks led the king the swift-footed son of peleus to noble agamemnon hardly persuading him enraged at heart on account of his companion but when advancing they reached the tent of agamemnon he straightway ordered the clear-voiced heralds to place a large tripod on the fire if he could persuade the son of peleus to wash away the bloody gore but he sternly refused, and besides, swore an oath. No, by Jove, who is both the supreme and the best of gods, it is not lawful that ablution should come near my head before I place Patroclus on the pile, and have thrown up a mound, and shorn my hair, for not to such a degree will sorrow a second time invade my heart, whilst I am among the living. But nevertheless, let us now yield to the loathsome banquet. But on the morrow, O king of men, Agamemnon, give orders to bring wood, and dispose it, so as is proper that a dead body enjoying it should descend beneath the obscure darkness, so that the indefatigable fire may consume him very quickly from our eyes, and the people may return to their occupations. Thus he spoke, but they indeed readily listened to him and obeyed. Then they, each sedulously preparing supper, feasted, nor did their mind lack aught of an equal feast. But when they had dismissed the desire of food and drink, some departed in order to lie down, each to his tent. But the son of Phileus, on the contrary, amid his many myrmidons, lay near the shore of the far-sounding sea, heavily moaning, in a clear spot where the waves splashed against the shore. When sweet sleep, diffused around, took possession of him, relaxing the care of his mind. For he was very much fatigued as to his fair knees, chasing Hector at wind-swept Ilium. But to him came the spirit of wretched Patroclus, like unto him in all things, as to bulk, and beautiful eyes, and his voice. And like garments also were around his body, and he stood over his head, and addressed him. Sleepest thou, O Achilles, and art thou forgetful of me? Thou didst not indeed neglect me when alive, but now that I am dead. Bury me, that I may as soon as possible pass the gates of Hades, the spirits, the images of the deceased, drive me far away, nor by any means permit me to be mingled with them beyond the river. But thus I do wander round the ample-gated dwelling of Hades. But give me thy hand, I beseech thee, for I shall not again return from Hades after thou hast made me a partaker of the fire. For by no means shall we, being alive, sitting apart from our dear companions, deliberate counsels. But the hateful fate which befell me when born has snatched me away, and to thyself also a god like Achilles thy fate is to perish beneath the wall of the noble Trojans. 
But another thing I bid, and will command, O Achilles, if thou wilt obey, not to lay my bones apart from thine. But as we were nurtured together in thy palaces, when Menoetius led me from Opus, a little boy, to thy home, on account of a melancholy homicide, on that day, when imprudent, I slew the son of Amphidamus, not wishing it, and raged about the dice. Then Peleus received me in his abode, carefully reared me, and named me thy attendant. So may the same tomb contain our bones, the golden vase which thy venerable mother gave thee. But him swift-footed Achilles answering addressed, why o venerable friend hast thou come to me and commandest each of these things to me yet will i readily accomplish all these things for thee and obey as thou commandest but stand nearer to me that embracing each other even for a little while we may indulge in sad lamentation thus then having spoken he stretched out with his friendly arms nor caught him for the spirit went gibbering beneath the earth like smoke then achilles sprang up astonished and clapped together his hands and spoke this doleful speech alas there is indeed then even in the dwellings of hades a certain spirit and image but there is no body in it at all for all night the spirit of miserable patroclus stood by me groaning and lamenting and enjoined to me each particular and was wonderfully like unto himself thus he spoke and excited among them all a longing for lamentation and rosy-fingered morn appeared to them while weeping around the miserable corpse but king agamemnon incited everywhere from the tents both mules and men to bring wood and for this a brave man was roused meriones the servant of valor-loving idomeneus and they went holding in their hands wood lopping axes and well-twisted ropes and before them went the mules they passed over many ascents descents and straightways and crossways but when they reached the forest of many rilled ida hastening they cut down the towering oaks with a keen-edged brass these greatly resounding fell and the greeks then splitting them tied them upon the mules but they pained the ground with their hooves eager to reach the plain through the close thickets but all the woodcutters carried trunks of trees for so Marionis, the servant of valor-loving Adomineus, ordered and afterwards threw them in order upon the shore where achilles designed a mighty tomb for patroclus and for himself but when they had thrown on all sides immense quantities of wood remaining there in a body they sat down but achilles immediately ordered the warlike myrmidons to gird on the brass and to yoke each his horses to his chariot but they arose and were arrayed in their armor and both the combatants and the charioteers ascended their chariots the cavalry indeed first but a cloud of infantry followed after in myriads and in the midst his companions bore patroclus they covered all the dead body over with hair which cutting off they threw upon it but noble achilles held his head behind grieving for he was sending a blameless companion to hades but they when they reached the place where achilles pointed out to them laid him down and immediately heaped on abundant wood for him then again swift-footed achilles remembered another thing standing apart from the pile he cut off his yellow hair which he had nurtured blooming for the river spurcius and moaning he spake looking upon the dark sea in vain o spurcius did my father peleus vow to thee that i returning to my dear native land should there cut off my hair for thee and offer a sacred hecatomb and besides that i would in the same place sacrifice fifty male sheep at the fountains where are a grove and fragrant altar to thee thus the old man spake but thou hast not fulfilled his will and now since i return not to my dear fatherland i will give my hair to the hero patroclus to be born with him thus saying he placed his hair in the hands of his dear companion and excited amongst them all a longing for weeping and the light of the sun had certainly set upon them mourning had not achilles standing beside straightway addressed agamemnon o son of atreus for to thy words the people of the greeks most especially hearken it is possible to satiate oneself even with weeping but now do thou dismiss them from the pile and order them to prepare supper o son of atreus for to thy words the people of the greeks most especially hearken it is possible to satiate oneself even with weeping but now do thou dismiss them from the pile and order them to prepare supper we to whom the corpse is chiefly a care will labor concerning these things but let the chiefs remain with us but when the king of men agamemnon heard this he immediately dispersed the people among the equal ships but the mourners remained there and heaped up the wood they formed a pile a hundred feet this way and that and laid the body upon the summit of the pile grieving at heart 
Many fat sheep and stamping-footed, bent-horned oxen they skinned and dressed before the pile, from all of which magnanimous Achilles, taking the fat, covered over the dead body with it from head to feet, and heaped around the skinned carcasses. Leaning towards a bier, he likewise placed vessels of honey and oil, and sighing deeply, hastily threw upon the pyre four high-necked steeds. There were nine dogs, companions at the table of the departed king, and slaying two of them, he cast them upon the pile, also twelve gallant sons of the magnanimous Trojans, slaying them with the brass, and he designed evil deeds in his mind. Next he applied to it the iron strength of fire, that it might feed upon it. Then he groaned aloud, and addressed his beloved companion by name. Hail, O Patroclus, even in the dwellings of Hades, for I now fulfill all things which I firmly promise thee. Twelve brave sons of the magnanimous Trojans, all these along with thee shall the fire consume. But I will not suffer Hector, the son of Priam, to be devoured by fire, but by the dogs. Thus he spoke, threatening, but about him the dogs were not busied, for Venus, the daughter of Jove, drove off the dogs both days and nights, and anointed him with a rosy, unguent ambrosial, that he might not lacerate him, dragging him along. Over him also Phoebus Apollo drew a dark cloud from heaven to the plain, and overshadowed the whole space, as much as a dead body occupied, lest the influence of the sun should previously dry the body all around, with the nerves and limbs. Yet the pile of dead Patroclus burned not. Then again noble Achilles meditated other things. Standing apart from the pile, he prayed to two winds, Boreas and Zephyrus, and promised fair sacrifices, and pouring out many libations with a golden goblet, he supplicated them to come, that they might burn the body with fire as soon as possible, and the wood might hasten to be burned. But swift Iris, hearing his prayers, went as a messenger to the winds. They indeed together at home with fierce-breathing Zephyrus were celebrating a feast, when Iris hastening stood upon the stone threshold. But when they beheld her with their eyes, they rose up and invited her to him, each of them. But she, on the contrary, refused to sit down, and spoke this speech. No seat for me, for I return again to the flowings of the ocean, to the land of the Ethiopians, where they sacrifice hecatombs to the immortals, that now I too may have a share in their offerings. But Achilles now supplicates Boreas and Sonorus Zephyrus to come, that ye may kindle the pile to be consumed, on which lies Patroclus, whom all the Greeks bewail. She indeed, thus having spoken, departed, but they hastened to go with a great tumult, driving on the clouds before them. Immediately they reached the sea, blowing, and the billow was raised up beneath their sonorous blast. But they reached the very fertile Troad, and fell upon the pile, and mightily resounded the fiercely burning fire. All night, indeed, did they together toss about the blaze of the pyre, shrilly blowing, and all night, with Achilles, holding a double cup, poured wine upon the ground, drawing it from a golden goblet, and moistened the earth, invoking the manes of wretched Patroclus. And as a father mourns, consuming the bones of his son, a bridegroom who, dying, has afflicted his unhappy parents, so mourned Achilles, burning the bones of his companion, pacing pensively beside the pile, groaning continually. But when Lucifer arrived, proclaiming light over the earth, after whom saffron-vested morn is diffused over the sea, then the pyre grew languid, and the flame decayed, and the winds departed again, to return home through the Thracian sea. But the sea groaned indeed, raging with swelling billow. But Pelides, going apart from the pile, reclined fatigued, and upon him fell sweet sleep, the others, however, were assembling in crowds round the son of Atreus, the noise and tumult of whom, approaching, awoke him, and being raised up, he sat and addressed them. O son of Atreus, and ye other chiefs of the Greeks, first indeed extinguish the whole pile, as much as the fire has seized, with dark wine, and then let us collect the bones of Patroclus, the son of Menoetius, well discriminating them, for they are readily distinguished, for he lay in the centre of the pyre, but the others, both horses and men, were burned promiscuously at the extremity, and let us place them in a golden vessel, and with a double layer of fat, till I myself be hidden in Hades, and I wish that a tomb should be made, not very large, but of such a size as is becoming. But do ye, O Achaeans, hereafter make it both broad and lofty, you who may be left behind me at the many benched barks. Thus he spoke, and they obeyed the swift-footed son of Peleus, First of all, indeed, they totally extinguished the pyre with dark wine, as much as the fire had invaded, and the deep ashes fell in, and weeping they collected the white bones of their mild companion into a golden vessel, and a double layer of fat. Then laying them in the tent, they covered them with soft linen. 
Next they marked out the area for the tomb, and laid the foundations around the pile, and immediately upraised a mound of earth, and heaping up the tomb returned. But Achilles detained the people there, and made the wide assembly sit down. But from the ships he brought forth prizes, goblets, tripods, horses, mules, and sturdy heads of oxen, and slender-waisted women, and hoary iron. First he staked as prizes for swift-footed steeds, a woman to be borne away, faultless, skilled in works, as well as a handled tripod of two-and-twenty measures for the first. But for the second he staked a mare six years old, unbroken, pregnant with a young mule. For the third he staked a fireless tripod, beautiful, containing four measures, yet quite untarnished. For the fourth he staked two talents of gold, and for the fifth he staked a double vessel, untouched by the fire. Erect he stood, and spoke this speech to the Greeks. O son of Atreus, and ye other well-grieved Greeks, these prizes lie in the circus awaiting the charioteers. If now, indeed, in honour of another, we Grecians were contending, then truly would I receiving bear the first prizes to my tent, for ye know how much my steeds surpass in excellence, for they are both immortal, and Neptune gave them to my father Peleus, who again delivered them to me. But nevertheless, I and my solid hooved steeds will remain apart from the contest, because they have lost the excellent might of such a charioteer, who very often poured the moist oil over their manes, having washed them with limpid water. They indeed standing lament him, but their manes hang down upon the ground, and they stand grieved at heart. However do ye others through the army prepare, whoever of the Greeks confides in his steeds and well-fastened chariots. Thus spoke the son of Peleus, but the swift charioteers arose, but far the first arose Eumelus, king of men, the dear son of Admetus, who surpassed in equestrian skill. After him arose the son of Tydeus, valiant Diomede, and led under the yoke of the horses of Tros, which he formerly took from Aeneas. But Apollo preserved himself alive, next to whom arose the most noble son of yellow-haired Atreus, Menelaus, and led beneath the yoke fleet steeds Agamemnon's mare Athe, and his own stallion Podargus. Her Echipolis, the son of Anchises, had presented as a gift to Agamemnon, that he need not follow him to wind-swept Ilium, but staying there might be delighted, for Jove had given him great wealth, and he dwelt in wise Sicyon. Her persevering in the race, he led under the yoke. But Antilochus the fourth harnessed his beautiful maned steeds, the illustrious son of the magnanimous king Nestor, the son of Neleus, and swift-footed Pelion-born steeds drew his chariot for him. But his father, standing near, spoke for his good, advising him, though himself prudent. O Antilochus, assuredly indeed both Jove and Neptune have loved thee, although being young, and have taught thee all kind of equestrian exercise, wherefore there is no great need to instruct thee, for thou knowest how to turn the goals with safety, but thy horses are very slow to run, wherefore I think that disasters may happen. Their horses indeed are more fleet, but they themselves know not how to manoeuvre better than thou self. But come now, beloved one, contrive every manner of contrivance in thy mind, lest surprises by any chance escape thee. By skill is a woodcutter much better than by strength, and again by skill the pilot directs upon the dark sea the swift ship, tossed about by the winds, and by skill charioteer excels charioteer, one man who was confident in his steeds and chariot turns imprudently hither and thither over much ground, and his steeds wander through the course, nor does he rein them in. But he, on the contrary, who is acquainted with stratagem, though driving inferior steeds, always looking at the goal, turns it close, nor does it escape him in what manner he may first turn the course with his leathern reins. But he holds on steadily, and watches the one who is before him. But I will show thee the goal easily distinguished, nor shall it escape thy notice. A piece of dry wood as much as a cubit stands over the ground, either of oak or of larch, which is not rotted by rain, and two white stones are placed on either side, in the narrow part of the way. But the race-course around is level, either it is the monument of some man long since dead, or perhaps it has been a goal in the time of former men, and now swift-footed noble Achilles has appointed it the goal. Approaching this very closely, drive thy chariot and horses near, but incline thyself gently towards the left of the steeds, in the well-joined chariot-seat, and cheering on the right-hand horse, apply the whip, and give the rein with thy hands. Let thy left-hand horse, however, be moved close to the goal, so that the nave of the well-made wheel may appear to touch the top of the post. But avoid to touch upon the stone, lest thou both wound thy horses, 
and break thy chariots in pieces, and be a joy to the others, and a disgrace to thyself. But my beloved son, mine to be on thy guard, for if at the goal thou couldst pass by in the course, there will not be one who could overtake thee in pursuit, nor pass thee by, not if behind he drives noble Arion, the swift steed of Adrastus, which was from a god in race, or those of Laomedon, which, excellent, have here been reared. Thus speaking, Nelean Nestor sat down again in his own place, when he had mentioned the most important points of each matter to his son, and Mariona's fifth harnessed his beautiful maned steeds. Then they ascended their chariots, and cast lots into the helmet. Achilles shook, and the lot of Antilochus, son of Nestor, leaped forth. After him King Eumelus was allotted, but after him a spear-renowned Menelaus, son of Atreus, and Meriones was allotted to drive after him. But the son of Tydeus, by far the bravest, was allotted to drive his coursers last. Then they stood in order, and Achilles pointed out the goals afar off in the level plain, and near it placed godlike Phoenix as an umpire, the armor-bearer of his own sire, that he might attend to the race and report the truth. Then they all at once raised their lashes over their steeds, and struck them with the reins, and cheered them on with words incessantly. But they rapidly flew over the plain, far away from the ships, swiftly, and beneath their breasts the excited dust stood up, raised like a cloud or a whirlwind, whilst their manes were tossed about by the breath of the wind. Sometimes, indeed, the chariots approached the fruitful earth, and at others abounded aloft. But the drivers stood erect in their chariots, and the heart of each of them, eager for victory, palpitated, and each animated his own steeds, but they flew along, stirring up dust from the plain. But when now the fleet steeds were performing the last course, back towards the hoary deep, then appeared the excellence of each, and the course was immediately extended to the horses, and then the swift-footed steeds of the son of Ferris swiftly bore him away. The male Trojan steeds of Diomede, however, bore themselves next to them, nor were they at all far distant, but very near, for they always seemed as if about to mount into the chariot, and with their breathing the back and broad shoulders of Eumelus were warmed, for they flew along, leaning their heads over him. And certainly he had either passed or made the victory doubtful, had not Phoebus Apollo been enraged with the son of Tydeus, and accordingly shaken out of his hands the shining lash. Then from the eyes of him indignant tears poured, because indeed he beheld the others now going much swifter, whilst his steeds were injured, running without a goad. Neither did Apollo, fraudulently injuring Tydides, escape the notice of Minerva, but she very quickly overtook the shepherd of the people, and gave him his lash, and put vigor into his steeds. And to the son of Admetus, the goddess indignant advanced, and broke for him his horse yoke, and so his mares ran on both sides out of the way, and the pole was dashed upon the ground. He himself was thrown from the driving seat close by the wheel, and was lacerated all round in his arms, his mouth and nostrils, and his forehead was bruised near the eyebrows. But his eyes were filled with tears, and his liquid voice was clogged. Then Diomede, passing by, directed his hollow-hooded steeds, bounding far before the others, for Minerva had put vigor into his steeds and given him glory. But after him, however, the son of Atreus, yellow-haired Menelaus, drove, but Antilochus cheered on the steeds of his father. Push on, and exert yourselves, both of you, as fast as possible. I indeed did not order you to contend with the steeds of warlike Diomede, to which Minerva has now given speed and given glory to him, but quickly overtake the horses of Atreides, nor be left behind, lest Athe, being a mere, shed disgrace upon you both. Why should ye be left inferior, O best of steeds? For thus I tell you, and it shall surely be accomplished, attention will not be paid to you by Nestor, the shepherd of the people, but he will immediately slay you with the sharp brass if we, remiss, bear off the less worthy prize. But follow and hasten as fast as possible. These things will I myself manage and look to, to pass him by in the narrow way, nor shall it escape me. Thus he spoke, but they, dreading the threat of their master, ran faster for a short time. But immediately then warlike Antilochus perceived the narrow of the hollow way. It was a fissure of the earth, where the wintry torrent collected, had broken away part of the road, and gullied the whole place. Thither drove Menelaus, avoiding the clash of wheels, but Antilochus, deviating, guided his solid-hoofed horses out of the way, and turning aside, pursued him a little. But the son of Atreus feared, and shouted to Antilochus, Antilochus, rashly art thou driving thy horses, but check thy steed, for the road is narrow, and thou wilt soon drive past in a wider, lest thou damage both of us running foul of my chariot. Thus he spoke, but Antilochus drove even much faster, urging them on with a lash, like unto one not hearing, as far as is the cast of a quoit, 
hurled from the shoulder which a vigorous youth has thrown, making experiments of his youthful strength. So far they ran abreast, but those of Atreides fell back, for he himself voluntarily ceased to drive, lest a solid hoof steed should clash in the road, and overturn the well-joined chariots, and they themselves should fall in the dust while contending for the victory. And him yellow-haired Menelaus chiding addressed, O Antilochus, no other mortal is more pernicious than thou. Avaunt, for we Greeks untruly said that thou wast prudent. Yet not even thus shalt thou bear away the prize without an oath. Thus saying, he cheered on his steeds, and spoke to them, Be not kept back, nor stand grieving in your hearts. Sooner will the feet and knees grow weary to them than to you, for they are both deprived of vigor. Thus he spoke, but they, dreading the exhortation of their master, ran more fleetly, and became very near the others. But the Greeks, sitting in the assembly, beheld the steeds, and they flew along, raising dust over the plain. Then first Idomeneus, leader of the Cretans, distinguished the horses, for he sat outside the circus very high up on an observatory, and hearing him being far off, encouraging his steeds, knew him. He also perceived a remarkable steed outstripping, which in every other part indeed was chestnut, but in its forehead was a white round spot like the moon, and he stood erect and delivered this speech amongst the Greeks. O friends, leaders and chieftains of the Greeks, do I alone recognize the horses, or do ye also? Different steeds indeed appear to me to be foremost, and there seems a different charioteer, but those mares which hitherto were successful are probably hurt upon the plain somewhere, for surely I first saw them turning round the goal. But now I can no longer see them, although my eyes survey the Trojan plain as I gaze around. Surely the reins have fled the charioteer, and he could not rein well round the goal, and did not succeed in turning. There I imagine he fell out, and at the same time broke his chariot, whilst the mares bolted, when fury seized their mind. But do ye also standing up look, for I cannot well distinguish. It appears to me to be the Aetolian hero by birth, and who rules amongst the Argives, the son of horse-breaking Tydeus, gallant Diomede. But him swift Ajax, the son of Oileus, bitterly reproached. Idomeneus, why dost thou prate endlessly? Those high prancing mares run over the vast plain afar. Neither art thou so much the youngest amongst the Greeks, nor do thine eyes see most sharply from thy head. But thou art always prating with words, nor is it at all necessary for thee to be a prater, for others better than thou art present. For the mares of Aeomelus are still foremost, which were so before, and he himself is advancing, holding the reins. But him the leader of the Cretans, indignant, answered in turn, Ajax, best at abuse, reviler, but in all other things thou art inferior to the Greeks, because thy temper is morose. Come now, let us take a tripod or a goblet, and let us both appoint Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, arbiter, which horses are foremost, that paying thou mayest learn. Thus he spoke, but swift Ajax, son of Oileus, immediately rose to reply in harsh words. And now, doubtless, the strife would have proceeded farther to both, had not Achilles himself risen up and spoke. No longer now, O Ajax and Idomeneus, hold altercation and evil, angry words, for it is not fitting. And ye also would blame another, whoever should do such things. But sitting down in the circus, look towards the steeds, which themselves will soon arrive, contending for victory. And then will ye know each of you the horses of the Greeks, which are second and which first. Thus he spoke, but the son of Tydeus came very near, pursuing, and always drove on his horses with the lash across the shoulders, whilst the steeds were raised up aloft into the air, quickly completing their course, and the drops of dust kept always bespattering their charioteer. The chariot, adorned with gold and tin, rolled on close to the swift-footed steeds, nor was there a deep trace of the tires behind in the fine dust, but they, hastening, flew. But he stood in the midst of the circus, and much perspiration exuded from the steeds, from their necks and chest to the ground. But he himself leaped to the ground from his all-shining chariot, and rested his courage against the yoke. Nor was gallant Sothenelus dilatory, but he eagerly seized the prize, and gave the woman to his magnanimous companions to escort, and handled tripod to bear away, whilst he himself unyoked the steeds. Next to him Nelchian Antilochus drove his steeds, outstripping Menelaus by stratagem, not indeed by speed. Yet even thus Menelaus drove his swift horses near, 
but as far as a horse is distant from the wheel which exerting its speed with a chariot draws its master through the plain and the extreme hairs of its tail touch the wheel tire but it rolls very near nor is there much space between while it runs over the vast plain so far was illustrious menelaus left behind by antilochus although at first he was left behind as much as a cast of a quoit yet he quickly overtook him for the doughty strength of agamemnon's mare the beautiful maned athe was increased and if the course had been still longer to both he would surely have passed him by nor left it doubtful Marionus again the good attendant of idomeneus was left behind a spear's throw by the illustrious menelaus for his fair maned steeds were the slowest and he himself least skilful in driving a chariot in the contest but the son of admetus came last of others dragging his beauteous chariot driving his steeds before him but him swift-footed noble achilles seeing pitied and standing amongst the greeks spoke to him winged words the best man drives his solid hoofed steeds the last but come let us give him as is right the second prize and let the son of tydeus bear away the first thus he spoke and all approved as he ordered and now truly he had given the mare to him for the greeks approved it had not antilochus the son of magnanimous nestor rising up replied to achilles the son of peleus on the question of justice o achilles i shall be very indignant with thee if thou fulfillest this promise for thou art about to deprive me of my reward considering these things that his chariot and fleet steeds were injured he himself being skilful but he should have prayed to the immortals then would he by no means have come up driving the last but if thou pitiest him and it be agreeable to thy mind thou hast much gold and brass in thy tent and cattle and maidens and solid hooved steeds are thine taking from these give him afterwards even a greater reward or even now forthwith that the greeks may applaud thee this however i will not resign but let him of the warriors strive for her whoever wishes to contend with me in strength of hands thus he spoke and swift-footed noble achilles smiled favouring antilochus for he was a dear companion to him and answering addressed to him winged words o antilochus since thou now biddest me give something else to eumelus for my house this will i indeed accomplish i will give him the corslet which i took from asteropaeus brazen around which there is entwined a rim of shining tin and it is of great value he spoke and ordered his dear comrade automedon to bear it from the tent and he went and brought it to him then he placed it in the hands of eumelus and he received it rejoicing but menelaus also arose amongst them grieving in his mind vehemently enraged with antilochus then a herald placed the sceptre in his hands and ordered the greeks to be silent and then the godlike hero spoke o antilochus hitherto prudent what hast thou done thou hast disgraced my skill and injured my steeds driving thine before them which indeed are greatly inferior but come ye leaders and chiefs of the greeks judge between us both and not for favour lest some one of the brazen mailed greeks should say menelaus having overcome antilochus by falsehoods came off leading the mare as a prize for his steeds were very inferior but he himself superior in skill and strength but come i myself will decide and i think that no other of the greeks will blame me for it will be just o antilochus nurtured of jove come hither i pray as it is just standing before thy horses and chariot and holding in thy hands the pliant lash with which thou didst formerly drive touching thy steeds swear by earth encompassing neptune that thou didst not willingly impede my chariot by stratagem but him prudent antilochus in turn answered have patience now since i am much younger than thou o king menelaus and thou art older and superior thou knowest of what sort are the errors of a youth for his mind is indeed more volatile and his counsel weak therefore let thy heart endure and i myself will give thee the steed which i have received and if indeed thou demandest anything else greater from my house i should be willing to give it immediately rather than fall for ever o jove nurtured from thy good opinion and be sinful towards the gods he spoke and the son of magnanimous nestor leading the mare placed it in the hands of menelaus but his mind was cheered as the dew is diffused over the ears of growing corn when the fields are bristling thus indeed o menelaus was thy soul and thy breast cheered and speaking he addressed to him winged words antilochus now indeed will i cease being enraged with thee for formerly thou wert neither foolish nor volatile though now youth has subdued reason avoid a second time overreaching thy superiors for not another man of the greeks would have easily appeased me but thou hast already suffered much and accomplished many deeds as well as thy good father and brother for my sake 
Therefore will I be persuaded by thee, supplicating, and will give the mare also, although being mine, that these two may perceive that my soul is never overbearing or unrelenting. He spoke, and gave the steed to Noemon, the comrade of Antilochus, to lead away, and then he received the shining goblet himself. But Meriones the fourth took up the two talents of gold, in which order he drove, but the fifth prize was left, which Achilles, bearing through the assembly of the Greeks, gave to Nestor, and standing by him said, Receive now, and let this be a keepsake to thee, a memorial of the burial of Patroclus, for never more shalt thou behold him among the Greeks. I give this prize to thee even thus, for thou indeed wilt not fight with Asestus, nor wrestle, nor engage in the contest of hurling the javelin, nor run on the feet, for grievous old age now oppresses thee. Thus speaking, he placed it in his hands, but he, rejoicing, accepted it, and addressing him, spoke in winged words, Assuredly, O my son, thou hast spoken all these things aright, for no longer are my limbs firm, my friend, nor my feet, nor yet do my hands move pliant on each side from my shoulders, would that I were as young, and my strength was firm to me, as when the Epeans buried King Amarnesus at Bipresium, and his sons staked the prizes of the king, there no man was equal to me neither of the epeans nor the paleans themselves nor the magnanimous aetolians in the Cestus, i conquered clytomedes the son of enops and in wrestling ancaeus the pleuronian who rose up against me and on foot i outstripped iphiclus though being excellent and with the spear hurled beyond phileus and polydorus the two sons of actor drove by me by their steeds only exceeding me in number envying me the victory for the greatest rewards were left for that contest, but they were two. The one indeed steadily directed the reins, whilst the other urged on with the lass. Thus I formerly was, but now let younger men undertake such deeds, as it becomes me to obey sad old age, though I then excelled amongst heroes. But go and celebrate thy comrades' obsequies with games. This indeed I willingly accept, and my soul rejoices that thou art ever mindful of me nor am I forgotten by thee, with what honour it becomes me to be honoured among the Greeks, and for these things may the gods give thee a proper return. Thus he spoke, but the son of Peleus went through the great assemblage of the Greeks, when he had heard all the praise of Nestor, then he proposed prizes for a laborious boxing match, leading a mule patient of toil, six years old, unbroken, which is most difficult to be tamed, he tied it in the circus, and for the conquered again he staked a two-handled cup, then he stood up and spoke amongst the greeks o ye sons of atreus and other well-grieved greeks we invite two men who are very expert raising their hands aloft to strike for these with the fist but to whom apollo indeed may give victory and all the greeks approve leading away the mule patient of labour let him conduct it to his tent but the vanquished shall bear away a double cup thus he spoke and immediately arose a man brave and great skilled in the art of boxing epeus son of panopeus and grasping the patient toiling mule, said, Let him draw near, whosoever will bear away the double cup, but I think that no other of the Greeks, having conquered in boxing, will lead away the mule, for I boast myself to be the best man. Is it not enough that I am inferior in battle, for it is by no means possible for a man to be skilled in every work? For thus I tell you, and it shall be accomplished, I will utterly fracture his body, and also break his bones, and let his friends remain here assembled, who may carry him away vanquished by my hands. Thus he spoke, but they were all mute in silence. But Euryalus alone stood up against him, a godlike hero, son of King Mecisteus, a descendant of Teleon, who formerly came to Thebes, to the funeral of the deceased Oedipus, and there vanquished all the Cadmians. About him the spear-renowned son of Tydeus was busied, encouraging him with words, for he greatly wished victory to him, and first he threw around him his girdle, and then gave him the well-cut thongs made of the hide of a rustic ox. But they twain, having girded themselves, proceeded into the middle of the circus, and both at the same time engaged, with their strong hands opposite, raising them up, and their heavy hands were mingled. Then a horrid crashing of jaws ensued, and the sweat flowed on all sides from their limbs. Then noble Epeus rushed in, and smote him upon the cheek while looking round, nor could he stand any longer, but his fair limbs tottered under him, and as when from beneath the surface rippled by the north wind a fish leaps out upon the weedy shore, and the dark billows covers it, so he, stricken, sprang up. But magnanimous Epeus, taking him in his hands, lifted him up, 
and his dear comrades stood around, who conducted him through the circus on tottering feet, spitting out clotted gore, and drooping his head on each side, and then leading, placed him among them, insensible, while they departing received the double cup. But the son of Peleus quickly staked other third prizes for laborious wrestling, exhibiting them to the Greeks, for the conqueror indeed a large tripod ready for the fire, which the Greeks estimated amongst themselves at twelve oxen, and for the conquered person he placed a female in the midst. She understood various works, and they reckoned her at four oxen. But he stood up, and spoke this speech among the Greeks. Arise, ye who will make trial of this contest. Thus he spoke. But then arose mighty Telamonian Ajax, and wise Ulysses stood up, skilled in stratagems. But these two, having girded themselves, advanced into the midst of the circus, and grasped each other's arms with their strong hands, like the rafters of a lofty dome, which a renowned architect has fitted, guarding off the violence of the winds. Then their backs creaked, forcibly dragged by their powerful hands, and the copious sweat poured down, and thick welds, purple with blood, arose upon their sides and shoulders. Yet always eagerly they sought desired victory, for the sake of the well-made tripod, Neither could Ulysses trip, nor throw him to the ground, nor could Ajax him, for the valiant might of Ulysses hindered him. But when at length they were wearying the well-grieved Greeks, then mighty Telamonian Ajax addressed him, O most noble son of Laertes, Ulysses of many wiles, either lift up me or I thee, and all these things will be a care to Jove. So saying, he lifted him up, but yet was not Ulysses mindful of a stratagem, Aiming at his ham, he struck him behind, and relaxed his limbs, and threw him on his back. But Ulysses fell upon his breast, then the people admiring gazed, and were stupefied. Next noble much-enduring Ulysses lifted him in turn, and moved him a little from the ground, nor did he lift him up completely. But he bent his knee, and both fell upon the ground near to each other, and were defiled with dust. And getting up, they had surely wrestled for the third time, had not Achilles himself stood up and restrained them. No longer contend, nor exhaust yourselves with evils, for there is victory to both. So depart, receiving equal rewards, in order that the other Greeks may also contend. Thus he spoke, but they indeed heard him willingly, and obeyed, and wiping off the dust, put on their tunics. But the son of Peleus immediately staked other rewards of swiftness, a wrought silver cup, which contained indeed six measures, but in beauty much excelled all upon the whole earth, for the ingenious Sidonians had wrought it cunningly, and Phoenician men had carried it over the shadowy sea, and exposed it for sale in the harbours, and presented it as a gift to Thoas. Aeoneus, son of Jason, however, had given it to the hero Patroclus as a ransom for Lycaon, son of Priam. This also Achilles offered as a new prize to be contended for in honour of his companion, whoever should be the nimblest on swift feet. For the second again he proposed an ox, large and luxuriant in fat, and for the last he staked half a talent of gold, but he stood upright and spoke amongst the Greeks. Arise, ye who will make trial of this contest also. Thus he spoke, and immediately swift Ajax, son of Oileus, arose, and much enduring Ulysses, and after them Antilochus, son of Nestor, for he indeed excelled all the youths in fleetness. But they stood in order, and Achilles pointed out the goal, and their course was stretched out from the goal. Then swiftly leaped forth the son of Oileus, but very close after him rushed noble Ulysses, as when a shuttle is at the breast of a well-girdled dame, which she throws very skilfully with her hands, drawing out the woof and inserting them into the warp, and holds it near her breast. So ran Ulysses near him, and with his feet trod on his footsteps behind, before the dust was shed over them. But noble Ulysses, constantly running swiftly, exhaled his breath upon his head, and all the Greeks shouted to him, eager for victory, and encouraged him, hastening rapidly. But when they were now completing their last course, Ulysses forthwith prayed in his mind to his ear-haired Minerva, Hear, O goddess, come a propitious assistant to my feet. Thus he spoke praying, but Pallas Minerva heard him, and she made his limbs nimble, his feet and his hands above. But when they were just about to fly in upon the prize, then Ajax slipped while running, for Minerva did the mischief, where the dung of the deep lowing slaughtered oxen was around, which swift-footed Achilles had slain in honour of Patroclus. Then much enduring noble Ulysses took up the goblet, as he came running the first, and illustrious Ajax received the ox. But he stood holding the horn of the rustic ox in his hand, and spitting out the dung, spoke amongst the Greeks. Alas! Surely a goddess injured my feet, whoever of old stands by Ulysses as a mother, and assists him. Thus he spoke, and they all then laughed heartily at him, but Antilochus next bore away the last prize, smiling, and spoke among the Greeks. 
I will tell you all, my friends, though now knowing it, that even still the immortals honor the aged, for Ajax indeed is a little older than I am, but he is of a former generation and former men, and they say that he is of crude old age, and it is difficult for the Greeks to contend in swiftness with him, except for Achilles. Thus he spoke, and praised the swift-footed son of Peleus, but Achilles answering addressed him with winged words. Thy praise, O Antilochus, shall not be spoken in vain, but for thee I will add half a talent of gold. So saying, he placed it in his hands, and he, rejoicing, received it. But the son of Peleus, bearing it into the circus, laid down a long spear, and a shield, and helmet, and arms of Sarpedon, which Patroclus had stripped him of, and stood upright, and spoke amongst the Greeks. We invite two warriors, whoever are bravest, having put on these arms, and seizing the flesh-rending brass, to make trial of each other before the host for these. Whoever shall be the first to wound the fair flesh, and touch the entrails through the armor and black blood, to him indeed will I give this silver-studded beautiful Thracian sword, which I formerly took from Asteropaeus. But let both bear away these arms in common, and before them I will place a splendid banquet in my tents. Thus he spoke. But then arose mighty Telamonian Ajax, and the son of Tydeus, valiant Diomede, rose up. But they, after they had armed apart on either side from the ground, both came together into the midst, eager to fight, looking dreadfully, and stupor possessed all the Greeks. But when approaching each other they were near, thrice indeed they rushed on, and thrice made the attack hand to hand. Then Ajax indeed pierced through his shield, equal on all sides, nor reached the flesh, for the corslet inside protected him. But next the son of Tydeus, with the point of his shining spear, endeavoured to reach the neck over his great shield. And then indeed the Greeks, fearing for Ajax, desired them, ceasing to take up equal rewards. The hero, however, gave the great sword to Diomede, bearing it both the sheath and the well-cut belt. Then the son of Peleus deposited a rudely molten mass of iron, which the great might of Aetion used formerly to hurl. But when swift-footed noble Achilles slew him, he brought this also with other possessions in his ships. Then he stood up and spoke amongst the Greeks. Arise, you who will make trial of this contest also. Even if his rich fields be of very far and wide extent, using this he will have it even for five revolving years. For indeed neither will his shepherd nor his ploughman go into the city wanting iron, but this will furnish it. Thus he spoke. Then up arose warlike Polypoetes, and the valiant might of godlike Leontius arose. Also Telamonian Ajax and noble Epeus arose. Then they stood in order, but noble Epeus seized the mass, and whirling it round, threw it, but all the Greeks laughed at him. Next Leontius, a branch of Mars, threw second, but third mighty Telamonian Ajax hurled with his strong hand, and cast beyond the marks of all. But when now warlike Polypoetes had seized the mass, as far as a cow herdsman throws his crook, which whirled around flies through the herds of oxen, so far through the whole stadium did he cast beyond. But they shouted aloud, and the companions of brave Polypoetes, rising up, bore away the prize of the king to the hollow ships. Next for the archers, next for the archers, he staked iron, fit for making arrows, and laid down ten battle-axes, and also ten demi-axes. He also set upright the mast of an azure-proud vessel afar upon the sands. From this he fastened a timid dove by a slender cord, by the foot at which he ordered them to shoot. Whosoever indeed shall strike the timid dove, taking up all the battle-axes, may bear them to his tent. But whosoever shall hit the cord, missing the bird, for he is inferior, let him bear off the demi-axes. Thus he spoke. But then uprose the might of King Teucer, and uprose Meriones, the active attendant of Idomeneus, and taking the lots, they shook them in a brazen helmet. But Teucer was appointed first by lot, and straightway he shot an arrow strenuously, nor did he vow to sacrifice a celebrated hecatomb of firstling lambs to King Apollo. He missed the bird indeed, because Apollo envied him thus, but he hit the string with which the bird was fastened close to its foot, and the bitter arrow cut the cord quite through. Then indeed the bird ascended towards heaven, but the cord was sent down towards the earth. And the Greeks shouted applause, but Meriones, hastening, snatched the bow from his hand, and now held the arrow for a long time, as he had directed it, and immediately vowed to sacrifice to far-darting Apollo a noble hecatomb of firstling lambs. But he saw the timid dove on high beneath the clouds, which, as she was turning round, he hit in the middle under the wing, and the arrow pierced quite through, and it indeed again was fixed in the ground at the foot of Meriones. 
But the bird, alighting upon the mast of the azure beaked galley, drooped its neck, and its close wings were at the same time expanded, and swift its soul flitted from its members, and it fell far from the mast. But the people wondering beheld, and were stupefied. Then Meriones took up all the ten battle-axes, and Teucer carried off the demi-axes to the hollow barks. Then the son of Peleus indeed, bearing it into the circus, staked a long spear, and also a cauldron, untouched by fire, worth an ox, adorned with flowers, and immediately the spearmen arose. The son of Atreus rose up, wide-ruling Agamemnon, and Meriones, the expert attendant of Idomeneus, whom also swift-footed noble Achilles addressed. O son of Atreus, for we know how much thou dost surpass all, as well as how much thou excellest in strength and in the javelin, wherefore thou indeed mayest repair to the hollow barks, possessing this reward. But let us give the spear to the hero Meriones, if truly thou dost thus wish it in thy mind, for I on my part advise it. Thus he spoke, nor did the king of men Agamemnon disobey, but he gave the brazen spear to Meriones, and the hero himself gave the very splendid prize to the herald Talthybius. End of Book the 23rd, read by Stephen Carney.